Well, today we're debating the Kalam cosmological argument in the second of two philosophical deep dive shows on cosmological arguments. We're debating what has effectively become one of the most popular arguments in Christian apologetics in recent years. The Kalam cosmological argument posits that everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. The universe has a cause and that cause is God. Well, we'll be diving a lot deeper into those premises and seeing how my guests actually formulate them in the course of today's show. But this is an argument that was actually first developed by medieval Islamic scholars and it's enjoyed something of a renaissance in recent years thanks to leading Christian philosopher William Lane Craig who's combined it with modern Big Bang theory positing a beginning of the universe and often uses it as part of his cumulative case for God's existence in numerous debates. In fact, I've hosted one or two of those debates myself and he's used it there. Um, The argument has, of course, received a lot of coverage uh, from both sceptics and Christians over the years. Uh, Among those sceptics is uh, Stephen Woodford, who joins me on the show today. He's uh, an atheist who has a YouTube channel called Rationality Rules, aiming to debunk many apologetic and philosophical arguments for Christianity. Indeed, last year he published a video called the Kalam cosmological argument debunked. So we'll be hearing what he has to say about this particular argument. And opposite Stephen today is Christian guest Blake Junter, whose belief map website is an apologetics tool for navigating the key questions, evidence and objections around Christianity. He's going to be defending the Kalam cosmological argument on the show today. Uh, And in a way, we we began this last week with the, um, the cosmological argument made famous by Leibniz, the argument from contingency, why there is something rather than nothing. Um, But this time asking whether the universe began to exist and if so, whether that points to a cause beyond itself, namely God. I'm looking forward to this, the second of two of these philosophical shows. And uh, let's introduce my guests for the programme today. Uh, On the show for the first time, um, Stephen, welcome to the programme. Uh, thank you very much for having me, Justin. It, it's, it's a great. pleasure to be here. I really appreciate it. No, I appreciate you coming in. And uh, I, I've been able to watch some of your videos on YouTube. And um, as I say, last week, someone you also know, Alex O'Connor, was with us, yep. the, the cosmic sceptic. And your your channel, like his, seems to have been enjoying a lot of popularity in the last year or so. I think you've gone from a handful of subscribers to over 100,000 in, in just a year. Yeah, I've been following in his footsteps. Indeed. Uh, largely yeah. thanks to the help of... Hemant Meta to begin with, who okay. I know you've talked to um, yep. before. Um, so yeah, just yeah. there well, seems to be a cry out for it. So Hemant has been posting some of your stuff on his blog, the Friendly Atheist blog and so on. Yeah, and for sure. It. He gave me the initial boost. I ended up with um, a couple of thousand subscribers and then YouTube's algorithm then basically pays attention to who's I see. Doing it's all what. about the algorithms, isn't Pretty it? Much. <laughs> uh, as I'm experiencing as we try to grow our own YouTube channel. Um, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's fascinating. And I think you're a great example of someone who I'm assuming doesn't necessarily have any um, formal philosophical training, but who's kind of putting it out there in a kind of the public forum in a kind of yeah. accessible way, essentially. So I studied in university advertising, but I managed to push it as far as I could into philosophy to the point that <laughs> philosophers were marking my uh, stuff. My dissertation was in philosophy as well. So uh, there you go. But yeah. There you go. I, I, I often find that's the way people start off in something like medicine or something and end up becoming <laughs> philosophers. Um, I, I mean, um, speaking of, of the person we had on last week in, in, in your um, chair, as it were, Alex, the cosmic skeptic, um, you, you've done stuff together, haven't you? I know you've had one because you have disagreements yourselves about certain aspects of things. Like, Yeah, we, we tend to agree on pretty much everything, including the fact that we don't have free will and mm. big, big topics, which I'm sure aren't going to be relevant to today's discussion. Um but the only thing we seem to disagree on is whether or not morality is objective. Yes, I think you, it is. Whereas, you sort of take a Sam Harris line on that. Essentially, I think Sam Harris fails in a few areas, but I, yeah, okay. it's, that's the only disagreement we have. But ta- Alex is an incredibly yeah. talented young man, and if he thinks I'm wrong, I need to pay attention. <laughs> Um, well, I think you've been learning from each other by the sounds of it. And, and um, in a sense, you, you are both what I would see as as the, the good end, if you like, the, 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 the respectable end, let's say, of the, the atheist YouTube sort of arena, because not everything is great quality, let's let's let, let's admit. But but I'm glad to see both of you kind of taking arguments seriously, trying to engage. Yeah, with. I was going to say on that note that a lot of what you see on YouTube is derogatory towards Christianity, towards people and the approach that I take, and I think Alex does it even better than I, is that at the end of the day, these are people you're speaking to, and whether or not you think the argument is stupid, or whether or not it, you think people haven't thought thought it through, the answer is not to be nasty. You need to say, listen, 
here's the facts and here's a sensitivity to your state of mind. And if you're going to make any impact at all, that's how mm, you make it. Yeah. A lot of people don't respond to just you're wrong and it's just it's not, not, well, the way, I, not the way to go. I appreciate the way you, you try to undertake the discussion. Um, and um, it's not just atheists, though, that you're friends with. I know that you, the, the kind of connection for you coming to here was through um, someone, a, a pastor that yes. you're friends with. Um, so you, have you had these kinds of conversations not just over youtube but but in person with yes uh, it's my friend jim he's my ping pong buddy and he's <laughs> slowly but surely getting better than me which uh, i put down is, to his is, praying is he is he slowly and surely converting you or is it going in the opposite direction not what, really what i'm like? i'm interested in the arguments for god which is something we're doing today yeah. but but jim's more of um he comes of it more from an emotional aspect i hope he doesn't mind my saying that mm. and this is why he reached out to you and to others he says this guy wants to be converted essentially okay. could you show him do, the do you i mean that's an interesting way of putting it i mean would you say that you are genuinely open to believing in christianity i'm i'm i want to know the truth mm -hmm. and i would go where the truth takes me what i'm very sensitive of is that we're a pattern seeking evolved me uh, evolved ape and we see things when they're not there and we know this is true and i'm sure christians would admit this is true when it comes to confirmation bias and seeing things in other mm, religions mm. that are mutually exclusive with their own i just do my best to understand the substrate of epistemology and be earnestly true to myself when i'm asking questions not that fits what i want to be true like i'd love for example for there to be a heaven mm. where i can exist afterwards and see loved ones the problem is is that my wanting that there's no sure. truth on whether or not no, it's it, true and I, I, know, I know that you appreciate that mm, as well but mm. that's just the way I approach it yeah well um, I'm looking forward to getting into um, a, another deep philosophical issue the Kalam cosmological argument which you've given a brief treatment on on uh, your channel but we'll obviously give a little bit more time to today in the form of this dialogue with uh, our other guest at Blake Junter um, from the belief map website he I think you were on um, uh, beginning of last year with Justin Sheba if memory serves Blake talking about the hiddenness of God another philosophical issue um, tell us what you've been up mm -hmm. to in the meantime um, how uh, and, and just remind us as well what belief map is all about yeah well what i've been up to i actually uh, had a debate two days ago with uh atheist uh and also youtube personality matt delhunty so that came out of nowhere uh he was scheduled to debate uh an apologist named john mark reynolds and and he, he had apparently uh double booked and so <laughs> uh, i got pulled in last second and, and that was fun so that's one thing i have been up to recently wow um uh, and yeah uh beliefmap.org you you want me to say a little bit about what yeah, that is yeah and yeah and tell us what's been going on with beliefmap.org oh man all, all kinds of stuff uh so i mean for those who haven't visited before beliefmap.org is kind of an apologetics flow chart on steroids is how i like <laughs> to describe it so um if you go there uh there's what's called a mega menu on the left and it's basically got four green speech bubbles you can choose from which represent four different conversation starters so like uh, one conversation is, does God exist? And sure enough, today we're talking about one evidence for God's existence, namely that the universe began to exist. Um, and we're going to see that this is relevant because it arguably suggests that it had a God-like cause. So anyways, um, I'll be using Belief Map today, and I'll I'll just click on the God ex exists speech bubble here, and it's going to procedurally generate the evidences and counter evidences for that claim. Green is the Christian, red is always the non-Christian. Um, and so uh, this is uh, going to have it, it, just the evidence that I need that the universe began to exist. And, and, and if is, I click it, that's go ahead. It, it's 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 a very innovative system, um, and I've used it myself. And and it, it is very kind of logical, progressive. You know, it'll take you in the directions that, that, that a conversation might naturally progress if you were in in discussion. So, um, and and in that sense, to to what extent do you? And I'll ask this question of of my guest last week as well. Believe Blake that these kinds of evidences um philosophical arguments and so on um are if you like important in bringing people to faith i mean a lot of people sort of when it comes to sort of some of the the higher more esoteric philosophical arguments for god think are we really making any difference by kind of having dis discussions and debates and arguments about this is this really the way in which people come to believe in in christianity what's your view on that blake yeah i mean i think everybody's different everybody needs something different uh, but certainly in early Christianity, the modus operandi was, uh, frankly, apologetics. If you go through the book of Acts, you're going to see that that's what 
Paul and these early Christians did. They went in and they lovingly debated out the issues. Um, there actually wasn't a lot, in historically speaking, of this making friends and very slowly introducing the idea. Um, they were very interested in the truth and they engaged in those important discussions and they reason constantly along the way. Uh, so I think it's a very important thing. And if you don't tend to the uh, intellectual culture, um, then you'll reach um, a situation where the culture isn't even going to take seriously your claim. So I think apologetics is really important, very important. Thank you so much for being on the program with me today. I'm looking yeah. forward to our discussion. We'll try, as we did last week, <laughs> maybe with a bit of limited success last week, to, to keep it uh, fairly, if you like, grounded in uh, and accessible for the lay person. I think the good thing is that whereas last week's is inevitably quite a conceptual abstract argument, the argument from contingency, I think there's something about the Kalam cosmological argument because it's talking about the universe coming to existence and we can sort of imagine that in the Big Bang that tends to grab people. It's a bit more of a sort of uh, something. I think that's probably why it's become quite popular as well. It, it kind of it, it sparks the imagination to some extent. Um, and what we're going to do in a short moment is actually hear um, how William Lane Craig himself often presents the argument through an animated video that his organisation, Reasonable Faith, put out a few years ago on their YouTube channel. It's all about YouTube these days, isn't it? <laughs> Radio is still good, but YouTube is is definitely the big the big place to be as well. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to go to that in a moment. Uh, just to, to say before we get to that if you're listening and you'd like your say on today's subject as ever you can email in unbelievable at premier.org.uk and i'll try and read out as many responses to today's show in future editions of the program as i can you can also tweet me at unbelievable jb or facebook.com slash unbelievable jb for the facebook page all of those links and of course links to my guests as well blake junter with belief map and uh, stephen woodford with rationality rules available from today's show at premierchristianradio.com slash unbelievable so why don't we as we get into our subject today on the kalam cosmological argument we're debating uh, whether the fact of the universe coming into existence if indeed it did um, is evidence for god and um, let's hear how this is often put um, by the probably the, the most prominent advocate of this argument today william lane craig in an animated video available from dr craig videos on youtube uh, that is simply called the kalam cosmological argument Does God exist? Or is the material universe all that is, or ever was, or ever will be? One approach to answering this question is the cosmological argument. It goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Is the first premise true? Let's consider. Believing that something can pop into existence without a cause is more of a stretch than believing in magic. At least with magic you've got a hat and a magician. And if something can come into being from nothing, then why don't we see this happening all the time? No, everyday experience and scientific evidence confirm our first premise. If something begins to exist, it must have a cause. But what about our second premise? Did the universe begin, or has it always existed? Atheists have typically said that the universe has been here forever. The universe is just there, and that's all. First, let's consider the second law of thermodynamics. It tells us the universe is slowly running out of usable energy, and that's the point. If the universe had been here forever, it would have run out of usable energy by now. The second law points us to a universe that has a definite beginning. This is further confirmed by a series of remarkable scientific discoveries. In 1915, Albert Einstein presented his general theory of relativity. This allowed us, for the first time, to talk meaningfully about the past history of the universe. Next, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre, each working with Einstein's equations, predicted that the universe is expanding. Then in 1929, Edwin Hubble measured the red shift in light from distant galaxies. This empirical evidence confirmed not only that the universe is expanding, but that it sprang into being from a single point in the finite past. 
It was a monumental discovery, almost beyond comprehension. However, not everyone is fond of a finite universe, so it wasn't long before alternative models popped into existence. But one by one, these models failed to stand the test of time. More recently, three leading cosmologists, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth and Alexander Vilenkin, prove that any universe which has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. This even applies to the multiverse, if there is such a thing. This means that scientists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Any adequate model must have a beginning, just like the standard model. It's quite plausible then that both premises of the argument are true. This means that the conclusion is also true. The universe has a cause. And since the universe can't cause itself, its cause must be beyond the space-time universe. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused and unimaginably powerful. Much like God. The cosmological argument shows that, in fact, it is quite reasonable to believe that God does exist. There you go, the Kalam cosmological argument as represented in a short video from Reasonable Faith on YouTube. Um, and uh, what I want to make sure, though, is that uh, having had that sort of helpful summary uh, in, in those particular words of the argument, that we hear from you, Blake, as well, what you actually <coughs> make yourself, where how you conceive the argument. And obviously, we want to hear the objections that uh, we're going to be hearing from Stephen in the course of the programme. Um, so probably good good moment to lay out, um, just uh, if you can, reasonably briefly Blake um, where you stand on this argument um, uh, whether you kind of agree more or less with the way it's presented in that piece I played or, or whether you'd have any differences to say in, in the way that you would present it I think that for pretty much any argument you can represent it deductively or inductively uh, and so I mean that deductive form is great because you can really understand um, how the evidence is working pretty quickly so I'm, I'm perfectly fine with starting that way for sure so when it comes then to to this this argument, it's, it's a reasonably simple one. The idea that, um, you know, anything that begins to exist has a cause. That's the first premise uh, normally as, as stated. Um, do you want to talk to that, to the, that, the first and second premise and, and why you, you find that the conclusion that that God exists, it, it makes sense on the back of that? Uh, yeah. So uh, I the video covered a, a few of those reasons. I, I would add one more. I suppose, and and that's this is if you want to question the causal principle, essentially that whatever begins to exist has a cause, then you end up running into uh, what gets called in philosophy a philosophical skepticism or an egocentric predicament. And so these are the situations kind of like, uh, you know, how do you know you're not in the matrix? Mm. Um, and and when your philosophy runs into additional of these that it wasn't required, that's a problem. And well, how does that relate to the causal principle? Well, if you question the causal principle, then suddenly you, you face this challenge that perhaps your phenomenological state right now, your mental state or your brain state, if you want to be really physicalist about it, um, just occurred for no reason whatsoever. Uh, and of course, this is a, a really bad situation to be in. And because you're saying that there's no cause whatsoever, you're essentially saying that there's no um, laws behind it or objective probabilities behind it. You can't even say it's improbable that you're in this situation. So this is an argument from Coons and Alexander Proust that I think is really um, effective. Um, as for why it's evidence for God, just very briefly, I mean, if space, time, and matter began to exist, then the cause of those things obviously can't depend uh, on those three things. That's going to require self-causation. So the cause is spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. And moreover, it's going to have both the ability and disposition to cause space, time, and matter to exist. And uh, kind of like the video alluded to, this sounds very suspiciously like God and functions as a powerfully fulfilled theistic prediction. And if you contrast that with atheism, it's uniquely awkward for them. Very surprising development. Okay. Um, well, 
let's let's pass the baton at this point to to Stephen. Um, I don't know where you want to begin, Stephen. I'll just allow you really to, to decide where you want to, to begin in terms of your critique of the Kalam cosmological. I, I almost have paralysis analysis in a sense <laughs> where I don't know where to start. Um, I'll start with complementing the Kalam cosmological argument by saying that I think, as you were saying, one of the reasons it's so popular is it's simple. It's premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Conclusion, therefore, the universe had a cause. One of the other reasons I think I think it's so popular is that it doesn't bite off more than it can chew because it's only trying to prove that there's a first cause. It's not trying to prove that there's a God that cares about who you sleep with and in what position. You know, you've heard mm, mm. all of that before. Um, my aim today is to... Obviously, what William Lane Craig does is... is expand it to he does because yeah. he adds in a sense this sense of well if this cause is outside the universe mm. it's timeless immaterial mm. powerful and so on would and, you and, consider those additions that he adds which is where he starts invoking um fine tuning which is like the conversation that alex and cameron had that's an additional argument on top of the kalam clo- uh, cosmological argument even though craig hasn't presented it as such before um I assume that you two would appreciate that that seems to be the case. Well, um, what do you reckon, um, Blake? It, it, is, it, is it a stretch beyond simply saying there's a cause of the universe to say that cause has the characteristics of God? Um, obviously, um, Stephen here thinks that that you've got to have extra arguments, in a sense, beyond the Kalam cosmological argument to make to make that leap. Yeah, so uh, kind of the way you represented the Kalam at the beginning, Justin, is you added a fourth premise that basically takes you from if the universe has a cause, then the cause is God. But uh, sort of the canonical kernel version just ends with the universe has a cause, and then Craig follows that up with reasons to think that the cause is God. And so the question is, is this really an argument for God? Mm. Uh, and I would say it is. And and the, way, the reason it is is if you get evidence for a proposition, I think that that's enough for uh, um, it to count as an argument. And if uh, you have reason to think that um, the universe having a cause is evidence for God, if it's more probable on the God hypothesis um, than on competitors, then it can be as considered as evidence for God over those competitors. So in that sense, I think it's, uh, it is an argument for God. And, and, you know, we can just, you know, skip past this and say, well, uh, you know, whenever people talk about this, they go ahead and give the reasons to think it is God. Yeah. Stephen, yeah. Yes, I was just going to say that with that fourth premise of saying we call this God, a lot of people, the problem with the word God is that it's a label that's filled with connotations of a being that cares and um, that may be associated with certain books, whatever it might be. Whereas if the argument is just that if the fourth premise is, or third premise is that we just call this cause of the universe god that doesn't logically infer whatsoever it's just you it's, it's essentially like new age spirituality where they name energy god it, it's almost um disingenuous to do so but i understand that with additional arguments such as what william lane craig has added that's where you can start arguing that it's mm. personal i, I mean th- this this idea though your one of your main concerns are, as i understand it with the kalam argument is simply that yes it may if it's if it's valid, it may show that there is a cause, but it doesn't show that that cause is therefore God. It, it could be another cause potentially. Yeah. Is that is that your kind of essentially? So what I'd like to do within this conversation is to first show that um, the premises are unsubstantiated, despite what the video said and what Blake thinks, mm. and therefore the argument is flawed. If you're trying to get a conclusion from it, we don't have the information required to be so. Um, okay. have such a conviction well, on why, it. Why don't we kind of park the, the question of do, is the cause God maybe for mm-hmm. a little bit later on in the conversation okay. and start with some of your concerns with the premises themselves, if you like. Um, y- and, and, yes, yeah. I, I'm absolutely. So let's start with premise one then. Um, that being, just to remind people, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Or, as Blake has put it, if the universe began to exist, it had a cause. I'm wondering, Blake, what do you mean by begins to exist? By begins to, uh, let's define it this way, X begins to exist at time T if and only if X exists at T and X has no temporally prior existence. There are more careful analyses, but I think that's a, a good start. <laughs> okay. So, so you, just you to clarify to just, real just quick, clarify that. Yeah, go ahead. prior existence. Mm-hmm. Um, but go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, do, do clarify because you, you obviously 
immediately we're getting into some terminology that that may leave people floundering a bit but yeah what 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 if i what, could quickly add to that as well by saying that the strength of the Kalam cosmological argument that it is that it's simple and then when you mire it in um sophisticated language which is perfectly fine in academia you suffer the risk of of making it lose its greatest greatest asset which is its simplicity so it would be cool if we can keep this as colloquial as possible well yeah we'll, we'll aim to do that but but what what are you trying to express with that particular formulation of, of what we mean by begins to exist there um like well i mean I, i'm essentially saying something uh begins to exist if uh, it exists at a particular time and it has no temporally prior existence to that time mm-hmm. so it doesn't exist okay. before that time would would uh, i be correct so, in thinking that you're describing creatio ex nihilo which is the a term that's used in theology and philosophy which just means creation out of nothing is is that what you're essentially saying um, no, because something can begin to exist, even if even if it's. I mean, again, here we might have to ask what you mean by nothing. So, for example, mm-hmm. yeah. um, when you know a baby comes into existence, uh, there's a sense in which it's a brand new thing, but it's not necessarily creation out of nothing, depending on how you're defining nothing. Yeah, yeah, but it's still a brand new. It begins to exist. You you would you would speak of it as beginning to exist, but you acknowledge that obviously um, it's it actually come from other constituent parts uh, yeah. to create something new right. in that sense. Well, that's that's the point I'm essentially driving at, and I've got a quote from Professor Peter Milliken, and that is that we've all experienced change in the world and new things coming from old, such as when a house is built or a plant grows from seed, and as far as I can tell, such changes are indeed causally governed. But these creations were rearrangements of already existing matter. You know, we have like the first law of thermodynamics and its relation to the conservation and conservation of energy. We know that we can't create or destroy things. So it seems to me that every example we have of something coming from nothing, depending on how we define the terms, is something coming from material that already existed. And and so the we, we're going to have to go to a break, but but where I want to leave us just just to, so that we can throw this back to uh, to Blake uh, in the next section is, uh, as I understand it, your your main concern here is that um, when we talk of things beginning to exist, actually what we're really usually using that to mean is things material that already exists being rearranged into something that we might call new. Yeah. But so the universe beginning to exist is the only example we potentially have of anything genuinely coming to exist from nothing. Another way of putting it is that. All we have observed, all of the information that we have to plug into any kind of probabilistic argument whatsoever, has been material rearranging to make other material. So to assert that something comes from nothing is a far bigger burden than our intuition would make us feel. Okay, we're going to go to a break. We're doing another deep dive episode of Unbelievable today, looking at a classic argument, uh, a popular argument, the Kalam cosmological argument today, uh, in the second of two shows looking at these sorts of uh, family of philosophical arguments. My guests are atheist Stephen Woodford and Christian Blake Junta, and I hope you can continue with us on the other side of a short break. Got a very interesting program for you today on Unbelievable, where we're debating the Kalam cosmological argument, first developed by medieval Islamic scholars. It's really had a a renaissance in recent years through Christian philosopher William Lane Craig, who's combined it with Big Bang theory to say that uh, actually the fact that we can see a beginning to the universe means that there must be a cause, and that cause is God. That's a very simplistic way of putting it. But um, uh, it's often used in arguments. It's been picked up by many people. And um, uh, as uh, we're trying to kind of dig into it asking is it legit can uh, why do many atheists like Stephen Woodford my guest who runs the YouTube channel Rationality Rules disagree with it he's got a number of problems with it and he put up a video to that effect last year um, we're going to pull pull up some of those objections on the show today Blake Junter from Belief Map uh, the website for uh, those who want to navigate questions around evidence and objections for Christianity uh, he's going to be defending the Kalam cosmological argument today and uh, don't forget you can email your thoughts as well we'll make sure to give the way to get in touch again a little later we're trying to keep this as well um as, as sort of accessible as possible on the program today and um so these kinds of programs inevitably you have to use terms and terminology and uh, get it get a little bit technical at times the good news is you can always listen back again via the podcast uh, if, if you miss anything um so in that last section uh, blake uh, i think you know there, there's this very important sort of objection that stephen's raising which is but whenever we see anything coming into existence uh, in in everyday life it's always a rearrangement of matter that already exists um so we just don't have any other examples of things 
beginning to exist in the sense that a philosopher like William Lane Craig is speaking of the universe beginning to exist. Um, so are we justified in having this first premise, you know, that whatever begins to exist has a cause? Uh, given that the the type of beginning to exist that we're actually talking about um, always observing is is not the same as what we're proposing with the the universe itself yeah so uh very good i think what's important here is to remember the structure of the argument and what's happening uh so we just made an argument that the universe had a cause and then we're noting how this is more probable on theism than on, I would say, atheism, did you, to keep it simple. Sorry, and, did you just say that the universe sorry? had a cause? Mm -hmm. well, that would be begging the question. If you're trying to prove that the universe had a cause and you said that we've just demonstrated that the universe had a cause, that means you're starting no, with no, your conclusion, right? Just, just for now, I'm, I'm starting with the this other question that you had just brought up. And essentially what you're saying is, even if it had a cause, um, you know, we the cause isn't going to be God because all cause things are material causes. Well, I was more focusing on the idea of beginning to exist because we can talk about causality, and I'm sure we will, but I'm putting the emphasis on the idea of beginning to exist because we don't have any examples of something coming from nothing. Um, and so considering that you're proposing that one has happened with the universe, I'm wondering how you're inferring that considering you have no examples. If we follow so, the evidence, it would say that the universe itself must be must have essentially always existed if we just run on that logic. I'm not going that far. I don't claim to know things in, in areas where the laws themselves break down, but, but you do. Yeah, so on the one hand, I'd question um, this assumption about whether you're going to need prior examples. And what this is going to come down to is two things. One is what are, what is the actual evidence that the universe began to exist. And if the evidence is overwhelming, then we're just gonna have a case of something of the universe beginning to exist. And you can't get around it by saying, well, we haven't had In previous examples. And real quick, and the other thing I, I would point out is you gotta be very careful when making your argument not to beg the question against the person you're speaking with. So you wouldn't wanna, you know, in talking about whether God exists, um, you know, come across a Christian who says, well, the Bible says that God does exist because he's obviously missing something important, namely that you don't believe in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So when you say that basically all effects are ex materia, remember that you're talking to a Christian here. Well, here. I, I understand. Um, so that. I don't, I don't accept it. Real quick, real quick, real quick, real quick. Yeah, um, go So ahead. for instance, uh, I, I reject the assumption that there are no supernatural beings, and I reject the assumption that, mm -hmm. you know, my thoughts are just rearranged material. I think my thoughts were produced by an immaterial soul, and examples could go on. You're, so a, go you're a man of science, I've seen before when you speak on these topics, and you're, I'm sure you're going to bring up many scientific ev um, evidences for the Big Bang in just a second. Surely you understand that if you and I find ourselves living this experience on Earth, and we find that the evidence is overwhelmingly showing that absolutely everything we find is a recomposition of atoms that were already existing, then it's not good enough to just say, well, it must have started somewhere. You surely do realise that I'm not even having a specific opinion on this matter. I'm just saying, how do you overcome um, creatio ex materia? It's, you, we can bypass it, if you like, for the sake of conversation, because I have many other problems, but... I think this one on its own is enough to make the Kalam cosmological argument um, enough to allow someone to have big doubts in it. Yeah, and to reiterate, one is there are always firsts, and I don't even think this is a first because I just noted that there are many things which I disagree are rearrangement of atoms. I gave a couple examples, and I think we have a proof that the universe isn't just a rearrangement of atoms if you trace it back to a, okay. a singular state. Um, there's no way to re rearrange atoms because there are no atoms. So, Moreover, you can make like a philosophical argument from uh, last week's show where you can get back to something necessary, and arguably that's not going to be a re rearrangement either. No, that becomes, of course, a different argument. And I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I understand that you treat the Kalam cosmological argument as does many people, like one of many arguments that lead as pieces of evidence towards uh, the hypothesis of the Christian God or whatever it may be that you're trying to. Um, I mean, get if, to. if 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 I can just leap in with 
maybe moving on a little bit, a little bit to the question of causes. I, I appreciate. I, yeah, do, do you want to come uh, up? So, with sorry, I, I do. Th- do all forgive right. me for butting in a no, lot because fine. I just there is there's too much going on. Up here. Um, <laughs> We're going to need a second nonsense. show to, to fit it all in. But yeah, yeah go I ahead. just want to add one more problem that yeah. we have with the first that I have with the first right. um, premise. Premise, yeah. and this is pretty damning as well. Um, it was voiced by Alex to Cameron yesterday, and so I'm actually going to use pretty similar examples, but it's more applicable here, I find, and that is the fallacy of composition. So the fallacy of composition occurs when someone infers that something is true of a whole from the fact that it's true of one of its parts. So, for example, if a wall was comprised of small bricks, mm. um, it would be it doesn't logically follow to say that the wall itself is small. Yeah. We understand that that would be a fallacy. And another example would be that while it's true that every sheep in a flock has a mother, it doesn't follow that the flock itself has a mother. So even if every physical thing had a cause, it doesn't follow that the universe, uh, the entirety of physical things has a cause. Right. To, to, to say well, this, so this was, was essentially what, what I wanted to move us on to anyway. So you, okay. you've preempted. I wanted to talk about this cause mm. thing because mm. I think that's a, that's a key thing as well. One of your objections is this this notion that everything has a cause. Well, yes, we can maybe agree that um, when we look around us, the, the causal cause and effect happens all the time. Yeah. But are we? entitled to apply that same principle to the universe as a whole um which as as people like sean carroll and many others have pointed out uh, blake the the law the kind of physical laws kind of break down as you reach that that crunch point that we call the big bang anyway um and and are we entitled to start to st- continue to speak even of cause and effect when we're, we're kind of getting beyond the time barrier itself and and that kind of thing these these are you know some of the typical criticisms of the Kalam cosmological argument so where, where do you go when it comes to the the cause effect issue um in that first yeah, so, premise oh, yeah so um on this question of the fallacy of composition i don't think it applies here we're using uh this premise whatever begins to exist has a cause so this is a deductive argument. If that's true, um, then it follows that the universe has a cause as long as it begins to exist. And I say that because I'm not I'm not trying to make some compositional argument here. It's deductive. Yeah, um, I would just add that while we don't know much about quantum mechanics, there are interpretations of it that do show that something can come out of nothing, which of course puts this whole argument to rest. Um, but there's not enough evidence to conclude that that's definitely the case. There's others which um, still think it's deterministic. I think that's worth emphasising because it may just we may just find that quantum mechanics really does end this debate, period. Yeah, and I think you might be um, conflating two possible kinds of responses. One is I think you're essentially appealing to virtual particles. Is that right? It, it, you can appeal to anything. If something comes from nothing in the quantum world, then we have something that wasn't caused yeah I, I mean if you map it out there are two kinds of responses here one is hey something can begin to exist namely virtual particles and they come out of nothing then there's a completely different objection is that some events are seen quote unquote uncaused uh, because they're indeterminate namely quantum events are you wanting to talk about both of those not so much talk about either because you and I are not physicists I'm sure you'll agree um, and no, the I, entire I, I, area itself is actually relatively unknown so going to those areas to have definitive answers probably isn't the best thing but just acknowledging that there's there's movement in those fields and that there's well, it, people coming at it from different angles with different interpretations is just worth noting well here's the thing is um, that I don't think that's entirely true we know enough to know that this is not a counterexample to uh, the idea that whatever begins to exist has a cause. So this is a a quote from a a really prominent cosmologist physicist, John Barrow. He says, in a quantum system, the notion of a vacuum is a little different from our usual conception of such a state. It's not simply nothing at all. Rather, it is what is left when everything that can be removed from the system has been removed. It is the lowest state of energy. And my point is here that virtual particles are caused uh, by the subatomic vacuum. They come from this sea of fluctuating energy. So this is not a counterexample to the idea, you know, that that something can't come from nothing. But what about the indeterminism? Is this going to furnish an example where something can begin to exist without a cause? And at the quantum level, you got to understand that this only is going to work on the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which talks about this deep indeterminism um, that's associated um, with the wave function. And this is not, you know, although it gets brought up in textbooks, this is really, really disputed. And I, I, I don't think it's a majority position. 
it's also worth noting, you know, for instance, Sean Carroll rejects this, um, who I know you admire a lot. Yeah. Um, and what's finally is a final point here. Even if the Copenhagen interpretation is true, there's still a cause because it is um, the, the preceding wave state. Um, so what, what about uh, the, I don't think the, that the issue, Blake, that I often hear, which is, but can we even speak of cause and effect um, if we're kind of getting to a point where time itself breaks down doesn't cause and effect have to be temporal in that sense can you speak of the universe having a cause if you've gone back to a point where time doesn't actually exist yeah and there's a couple ways to interpret this like some people want to talk about whether you have a deconstruction of time itself um you know if you've gotten to the point of talking about wave functions but i think what you're bringing up justin is you're you're asking, well, if the universe is the very introduction of space and time itself, then in what sense can we say that the universe had a cause, given that causation de depends on the pre-existence of time? Is that kind of what you're getting yeah, at? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, excellent. And here I, I think it's important to uh, bring up uh, what's called uh, simultaneous causation. So um, think about uh, a chandelier that's being held up by a chain. There's a, a causal relationship, right, between the chain links and the chandelier, but there's no temporal duration that governs that causal relationship. And in the same way, when we talk about God uh, standing as the cause of the universe, we're not saying that he exists temporally prior <clears throat> to uh, the Big Bang or that first moment. Uh, and then uh, over a period of time causes the universe to exist. Rather, we're saying that God exists causally or logically prior to the universe. And this resolves any any of the problems with that worry. Okay. What do you want to say to some of this, the the way that, that I think, you know, Blake is attempting to deal with the questions of the quantum world and, and whether that does yeah. or doesn't disprove a kind of, uh, the, the, the you know, things coming to existence out of nothing and uh, and this question of temporal causality too? The best way to respond is that when it comes to quantum mechanics, I don't know enough. Right. And um, the thing is, the, the greatest physicists themselves say that if you think you understand quantum <laughs> mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. Um, when we're talking about the super small and the super large, our intuitions completely break down. This has been what the breakthrough's been with the, with these kinds of discoveries. I personally, with sensitivity to time, would like to move to premise two, if Blake is willing. Yeah, we can we can do that. Um, um, why don't we do that? In fact, uh, let's. It's a good idea. So, uh, remind us of premise two and give us what one of your objections to it. Absolutely. So, premise two is the universe began to exist, and we've been prematurely talking about this, mm. of course, because it's necessarily related. Especially if we restructure the first premise in the way that Blake likes to. Um, I understand that we have very strong evidence indicating that the observable universe once coalesced into a minuscule hot dense state, such as the red shifting of celestial mm. bodies, the cosmic microwave background, there's plenty, there's really good reason to think that it was once in a very small state. But we have nowhere near sufficient reason to believe that the observable universe began at such a time. To quote the renowned physicist and mathematician Gre uh, Brian Green. When we speak of the Big Bang, we often have an image of a kind of cosmic explosion that created our universe and sent space rushing outwards. But there's a little secret. The Big Bang leaves out something very important. The Bang. <laughs> it tells us how the universe evolved after the Bang, but it gives us no insight into what would have powered the Bang itself. So this just echoes what I was saying earlier, where everything is breaking down at this point. And you can see why people accuse others of having a God of the, gu uh, God, uh, God of the Gaps argument here. Because yeah, and you've said it's this in the, in the video. You, you, the, the final objection you have is that this is essentially an argument from ignorance as far as you're concerned because it, we simply don't know. We, we don't have access to what yeah. that stage of the universe is. People are simply inserting God into a mystery. What I tend to do with my videos and what I try, I'm going to try more and more in the future is show that Arguments have flaws themselves, but the people that use the arguments often commit additional flaws right. because of the way in which they're presented. And argument from ignorance is one of them. I don't think it's necessarily intrinsic to the argument itself, especially just the Kalam cosmological argument as presented. It is when it's um, applied by certain people. So I haven't heard Blake make an argument for ignorance, for example. Right. But but as it stands, the the, the, the premise, the universe began to exist... Uh, for you is not supported by the science itself because we don't know no. actually we just don't really know what what was going on in that those very first yes. mi microseconds of 
the universe. Correct. And the reason why I'm quoting others here is because I want to stress again, we're not astrophysicists. These are the hardest topics to know. And it, it frustrates me to hear people, especially theologians, if I'm honest, speak as if we know these answers and speak with authority. It's um, quite frustrating. I mean, you're more a philosopher than an astrophysicist, Blake. But do you think we are entitled to kind of say something as definite as the universe began to exist from what we do know of the scientific literature? Sure, sure. I mean, a, a lot of our beliefs aren't uh, necessarily formed by us uh, performing the experiments ourselves. I've never been to Australia, but I have good reason to think Australia is there. And I mean, so uh, when you want to say something like virtual particles come into being from nothing, uh, you t you know interrogate any physicist that said that says that, and at the end of the day, they'll grant it comes from something. I'm not saying uh, that thing, something comes from nothing. For, <laughs> in fact, you same, are. Same, same thing for a, an indeterministic or a, a, an uncaused event. So anyways, I think I think we know enough um, it, when you get a consensus of, of experts on on a particular issue regarding the this uh, Big Bang issue. What um, Stephen's alluding to is that you have kind of two ways to think about the Big Bang model. Um, the standard FLRW Big Bang model traces all the way back to a singularity and some people have a hard time conceptualizing what a singularity is but it's essentially a nothing point um, if you trace Can all I... the universe the expanding universe history backwards it reaches um, a point where all of the quantities become infinite and this is understood by physicists to basically be nothing do you, this is do a you standard know the standard model piece quick, of evidence here, Blake? Do, 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 uh, quick, okay let, let's allow Blake to finish his thought and then we'll, we'll bring I you in yeah, that's fine yeah yeah no worries and uh, what I want to say though is you get to a point where, uh, you know, on, on this Planck scale, unimaginably small, uh, right, like the like if you turned a, uh, a proton into the size of the universe and then you had a proton inside of that universe, that's the Planck scale. When you get down to this scale, um, physicists say we need a theory of quantum gravity to be absolutely sure that the big that it, this actually reaches a singular state. And so sometimes when talking about Big Bang Theory, you don't necessarily mean the full-blown FLRW fully extrapolated backwards. You might just say uh, after that Planck time, after that Planck scale. And that's what Stephen's alluding to. And and my, my response is, well, remember, for, first off, the most natural assumption is that it does go back. Uh, yes, a uh, a quantum theory of gravity could rub out that prediction, but you shouldn't you shouldn't expect that. And second, as the video pointed out, we have three actually four different ways of getting to a beginning, uh, or three ways from the physics alone to get to a beginning, no matter what you're doing there. And fourth, we have these incredible philosophical arguments that there has to be a beginning anyways. Go ahead. There's there's plenty of arguments that show that the universe existed forever, and there's some that are supported with physics. So we have many different theories, and there's not just one that the universe began. You have an enormous amount. People like to think that it's just the Abrahamic religions that suggested a, a beginning, but it's just not true. 3,500 years ago, you have the cosmic egg, egg concept with Hinduism and specific interpretations of that with um, viable scriptural uh, authority make the argument that the universe began to exist far before Christianity, which is something that is worth pointing out. But when it comes to the accumulation of evidence that we have, such as the red shifting of celestial bodies, cosmic microwave background, there's no doubt that everything we understand at the moment, or I should say there's little doubt, there's a decent amount of evidence, enough to say that there was a point where everything seemed to coalesce into a small, dense state. But the, the specific evidence we have for the universe having a beginning is based on primarily Einstein's general relativity. And I have a quote that I want to share from um, uh, Professor Sean Carroll, no surprise to you both. <laughs> but he said that the understanding that there's a beginning is based on general relativity, and we know that general relativity is not right. The reason we know it's not right is because, for one, it predicts a singularity, it predicts that things are infinite, and we don't think that's true. Also, general relativity is not compatible with quantum mechanics, which we do think is right. So we have a prediction that the universe began based on a theory that we have no right to trust. This is all to just say that we don't know enough about what's happened at the beginning to make these these sweeping assumptions. The, the real problem, the real conflict I see between science and religion is the way in which they go around trying to figure out answers. Science, at its best, because of course it's flawed because it's humans that do it, 
it starts with what does the evidence say and let's see where it indicates and let's not say we're certain on anything because there could be information that comes out and we've learned our lessons with Newton's law of uh, gra laws of gravity and how that got superseded by Einstein's general relativity but the religious you can see in the way in which they do their reasoning they start with the conclusion and then they look for evidence to verify that. And we know that there's confirmation bias. We know that there's problems. I think you're doing the same with the Big Bang. You don't have sufficient reason to say that we have a beginning. Go ahead. Um, feel free to respond there, Blake, and then we'll probably go to a break. And I would like to talk about the, the God hypothesis at the end of this argument as well before we conclude our conversation. But yeah, a response from you first. Yeah, I mean, he said there are arguments for eternity, and I'm I'm uh, very skeptical that there are any good arguments. So maybe if we could ever get to those, I'd I'd love to hear that. Um, but he asks also, how does the beginning get you God? And in this context, kind of like I said before, we're we're thinking evidentially, and you can have a beginning, for instance, be evidence for two. Uh, different theistic hypotheses or even some other hypothesis. The point is, is that it is evidence for the whole pool of hypotheses that make better sense of that, and atheism does not belong in that pool. So this is a fulfilled prediction that theism, and you can point out some other ideas, uh, got um, that atheism didn't, and that's enough on Bayesian confirmation uh, 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 theory uh, uh, to say this is evidence. Well, Sorry, did you want... I was just going to leap in there. Uh, obviously, you, at some level, you're you're holding out the two hypotheses um, here. The, the you know the kind of naturalistic view um, that that you equate with atheism there, Blake, and the the theistic view and saying theism accords better with what we now know of the universe than than atheism does. I mean, aside from that, there's something else that I did want to get to. I'm not sure we've got time for it in this section, realistically. But the, it's not just the science that that many people point to when it comes to talking about a beginning. Um, the Kalam cosmological argument was first formulated, as I say, in medieval times before anyone knew about you know Big Bang cosmology, and it was based on the on the fact that certain philosophical arguments also argue that you cannot have. Um, an infinite past essentially or effectively we'd never get to the present you know yeah. um that's putting it very simply uh do you think then that the science in some sense is validating the philosophical argument that there also has to be a beginning of time a beginning of the universe blake and then we'll we'll come back to Stephen. yeah absolutely um i mean just in terms of what the philosophical arguments are in a in one sentence it's one that an actual infinity can't exist in reality um, and if that's true, then you can't have a past series um, that's infinite in number. Uh, the other one is that, heck, even if you could get an actual infinity uh, instantiated in reality, um, it cannot be formed by adding, right? Because any infinite or any finite quantity plus another finite quantity is always going to be a finite quantity. So those are the two uh, categories of philosophical mm. argument. And, and in that sense, it, the yes, that second um, well, the first premise in that sense um, is is uh, it, it, well, the second or no, it's the second premise really that that applies to. It suggests that both from a philosophical and scientific point of view, you're saying there's that we're looking at a beginning of of time and space and so on. Um, right. We, and Justin, real real quick, yeah. uh, regarding Stephen's last statement, I would go back to what I said just before that because I noted how even given the uh, things that we're unfamiliar with. In, regarding uh, the quantum gravity state, we still have uh, scientific, not proofs, but really strong evidence is that uh, there's a beginning from those as well. So it doesn't depend on general relativity at all. Just just one minute to respond and then we'll go to our, our final break, Stephen. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what exactly I should respond to. Okay. Do you have a specific well, reference? Well, um, only, only whether you think that there is any... I, I wondered if you had a response really to that philosophical argument that, that we've that was was outlined there. You were saying that this, the, the Kalam cosmological argument, as well as many arguments for gods and non-gods, because in the West we kind of ignore all what's happening in the East and what's happening in... Mm. Asia, you know, Hinduism has existed for ages, absolutely ages, and it's very sophisticated with its arguments. It, in many cases, the arguments themselves are pretty much the same as what we have over here, but they don't necessarily tie it to a deity, it was the case of Buddhism. So that's an example of, of something that's religious, um, or a, of a religion that is not mm. one that believes in uh, theism. It's also something that has, that believes in a beginning of some sort, at least some interpretations. But what I will say is that science a couple of centuries ago was called natural philosophy philosophies where pretty much 
you can trace back all of our branches of science and knowledge because what happens is we look around and we make inferences based on our evolved state in the way in which we look around so we notice very quickly that there's cause and effect some people for some reason don't want to apply that to their own personality such as the case with free will but be just from that inference you can start building a philosophical philosophical case for there must have been a beginning and so mm. you can see why these things started they are intuitive the, i mean the problem is, is as i've said before and i can only echo again is that th- our intuition if it's taught us anything if science has taught us anything is that it's that our, our intuition is nearly useless it's even a detriment when we're talking about the ultra small and the ultra big okay we'll go to a break and uh, we'll return with my two guests on unbelievable today they are stephen woodford and blake junta talking about the kalam cosmological argument let's keep kalam and carry on as my friend Andy Bannister, who is terrible at puns, would say. Uh, That's what we're aiming to do on the programme today, and we'll be back in a moment. So we're into the final segment of today's conversation, uh, debating the Kalam cosmological argument, very popular argument in apologetics today, very much championed, of course, by William Lane Craig, who uses it in a number of his debates. In fact, getting on for seven years ago, I, I hosted probably his most his biggest debate in the UK in recent years um, with uh, Stephen Law at Methodist Central Hall. And um, and uh, true to form, he pulled out this as one of his sort of cumulative arguments for the existence of God, this idea that everything begins to exist. Um, well, everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. The universe has a cause. That cause is God. And um, we've, we've gone around the houses with Stephen Woodford and Blake Junta, my guest today, debating the nature of the universe. Well, did it really begin to exist? Can we speak of causes and so on? Uh, what what I do want to get to, gentlemen, is is the, the, the final part of the argument, which is, let's say we grant yeah. the, these aspects, you know, just for the sake of argument, um, would that give us God? In and and that's where you really began with the, all of this, Stephen. Yeah. Just just a reminder, though, that if you if you were looking out for these guys, Stephen Woodford uh, is on YouTube at Rationality Rules. Uh, well worth checking out his stuff, and uh, equally Blake Junter at Belief Map. Look for the website, and there are links from today's show to both of them. Hey, Justin. Real quick, can I can I give a thought on what he what he closed with before we went to break? Yes, sure. We go go ahead, and and then we'll we'll get and, into and, the God question. Yeah, like, go I'll ahead. keep it incredibly brief. Go ahead. Um, regarding those two philosophical arguments, it's not. I don't think it's true that intuition is useless. One of those intuitions is just going to be the law of non contradiction. And the challenge is, is if you want to accept that actual infinities are possible, then you're going to have to say that you can subtract uh, equal quantities from equal quantities and get at contradictory answers. And so this is one reason that, uh, you you know, William Lane Craig and others say, quite frankly, you can't have a past infinity of events. So I just wanted to get that out. Did you want to do a quick response on that? Very, very oh. briefly, I just want to say that I did. I did not say um, what he accused me well, of saying. Intuition um, is useless. You not intuition is very useful. It's just not a great tool it, in science, it, it's especially used- when it's applied to things where right. in, we can tell that I, our I intuitions mean, I, not working so great. The, the whole thing for me is that that whether or not this argument runs, mm-hmm. I just find it mind-boggling the idea of a big bang because mm-hmm. you know the, what, what the way Blake put it, you're going back to a point where you take a proton, the smallest sort of physical thing we yeah. know of in the universe and if you then went inside that proton treating it as a size of the universe and went down to another proton yeah you're still not there at the kind of the the, the tininess of this first moment and yet it's produced all of this yeah us here in and the it, studio and it gets even weirder because it didn't explode it expanded yeah it's and like... and what's it expanding into because the very concept of space and time is is itself being birthed in that moment and and for me the, 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 say what you like about this but if we can believe that believing in god's not that difficult frankly i'm i'm kind of one of those people who's like it, that's so weird what I was saying, where are you like is it that hard to believe in god uh, if if you could believe that do you know what i mean i'm just saying these I, things kind of boggle the brain the thing is is that when you see the conclusion like take for example evolution by natural selection when you just hear about it and you don't know any of the evidence you haven't looked at what's been said it's mind boggling to the largest extent you think well that's just a fairy tale the problem is is that when you look at the evidence that's verifiable by anyone in the world um you have an accumulation of evidence the very epistemology that we rely on to get any kind of inference that's when you realize that oh wow this this seems but to be it the is case. it is one of those things where where the truth is stranger than fiction in in the sense that when you you, you know mm. it, it is it is so so strange um such such a, it, it, a it's almost like it's designed to... so that we don't understand it <laughs> Oh, um, anyway, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent there, but, but what I wanted to come back to in this final segment is really to talk about the the, you know, the conclusion that God yeah. exists. If we if we were to grant, you know, everything begins to exist has a cause, the universe has a cause. 
can we then assume that this cause of the universe is God? Now, perhaps you want to start us off on this, Blake, because you're you're the one, as it were, making the claim that uh, the, if we if this argument does run, it does leave us with a cause that is God. Um, and the way that William Lane Craig puts that is that the cause must be timeless, immaterial, um, uh, uncaused, uh, immensely powerful, and so on. Uh, do you effectively simply? go the same route you say yes absolutely um whatever this cause is it has to have these particular properties and therefore we're entitled to call that cause god no i I wouldn't say that i I do agree that it has to have those properties you're not entitled to call it god when you look at the deductive form of the argument uh, i think that deductive form you should be able to translate that into an inductive form uh, because here, here's the thing. Um, there's this uh, saying in philosophy that says one mo- man's modus ponens is another man's modus tollens. What does that mean? Yeah, do, well, do explain. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, if you have a deductive argument that says if X is the case, then Y is the case, and then you use another premise, X is the case, to say that Y is the case, um, then someone can turn around and say, well, that just shows me that X isn't the case because I reject Y. Um, I think I followed so that, is, but yeah, carry on. Or the X isn't substantiated. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. But basically, any deductive argument, uh, you can reject it by okay. um, rejecting one of the premises because uh, you don't like the conclusion. That's essentially what it amounts to. And, and I would recommend uh, in those situations, take it instead as an inductive argument. And what he, we're doing here is we're looking at the fact that the universe began to exist and we're noting how this fits much better. It's far more expected on the theistic hypothesis uh, than competitors. If you want to say that there are other people in the pool that make the same prediction, which I would question, like, do they actually predict a beginning of, or, yeah, the beginning of space, time, and matter as a whole? Um, then great, then that pool gets evidence. But you need to acknowledge that they got the evidence, they got the prediction right, and they get a leg up in a way that, for instance, naturalism did not get a leg up. That's the way I think about it. I'm, I'm going to skip a lot of what, what I could say because I do want to get on yeah. to what you're pushing towards, Justin. But <laughs> yeah. I've noticed throughout this conversation, Blake, you're conflating atheism with naturalism. I've seen you do it with nihilism as well. They're not once someone becomes an atheist with the prefix a meaning not and fierce meaning you know someone god. that believes in god and you may argue that that's different in academia but i'm just treating it as is is the raw proposition that someone doesn't believe that a god exists it doesn't follow that they therefore believe everything that is natural it doesn't follow that they think there's no purpose or that that, that they might be a brat in a um, a brain a vat in a, bra- a brain in a vat <laughs> yeah yeah get the order right <laughs> um you, yeah, it, it bothers you, me that you seem to be attributing to me and atheists things that I don't necessarily believe. And if I get there, it's not because of atheism. It's because of um, other things that I have values for. I don't want the discussion quite to go down there, but I do think that was necessary to bring do, up. Do you want to make a quick response to that before we try and just round things out, Blake? Yeah, as he alluded to, um, you know, it's very easy to show that atheism is defined academically, like what the right answer in your... Uh, on your quizzes and in your textbooks is that atheism is a positive belief. You don't hold it with certainty, but a positive belief that there is no God. Um, and na- atheism and naturalism typically go together, but you can get rid of naturalism and just say atheism. And what I said before gets reintroduced. What Basically, I would just this quickly is a piece say, of data Blake, which fits better on theism than it does on atheism. I just want to it. say that if you define atheism in such a way, I'm not an atheist. But you have to hold in your head the two possibilities. So whenever you want to evaluate no. the truth, you want, you need to ask yourself two que- questions. What's the evidence for and what's the evidence against? And that means there's a That implies a that you need to know all of the things to be able to say what it's for and what it's not for. The default position is that things Sorry, don't exist. Say, Sorry, can you say uh, the first part of that again? Um, can you remember what I said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... I, I think you're, you're you're simply making the point that, uh, as far as you're concerned, there's you, when you say atheist, you don't mean a yeah. positive belief that the, no god exists. The point the point I'm saying is that you can say that it's defined that way in academia, and as Matt said to you recently, redefine it because if you ask an atheist, they're not going to tell you they know there's no gods because some gods fall necessarily into areas where we can't verify them. What they will say is that they don't believe in a god in the same way that they don't believe um, that Vishnu exists, uh, although that's already a god, but they don't believe that uh, the Loch Ness Monster is real. All this is to say is that they're just not convinced by the proposition. It doesn't follow 
that they're a naturalist or that they believe that there is no Loch Ness Monster. We, we are going to have to wrap up, I'm afraid. Um, we, we're running out of time, gentlemen. Um, final thought from you, um, if you would, Blake. Um, and maybe it's a chance to kind of bring this together as to why you think ultimately the Kalam, the God, if you like, uh, specifically the well, maybe not specifically the Christian God, but at least God in a in a broad sense is a valid um, induction, if if not deduction, from the Kalam cosmological argument. Sure. I, I guess one thing I want to say real quick is because of the nature of the radio show, we Stephen and I, and I have had to move really fast, and so of course um, I'm I'm a lot more cordial in my in my <laughs> We just we're like both dying to squeeze out information. Of course, but I, I fully accept that. Love... No problem. Yeah, yeah. Go, <laughs> um, go ahead, though. We we do need to wrap things up. Go ahead. Yeah. Um. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, I, I visit Belief Map and see how I, I frame it. Uh, just like I said before, I think the way you evaluate the truth of the question of whether God exists is you uh, ask yourself, what's the reasons to say yes and what's the reasons to say no? And I see that the universe began to exist as a reason to say yes, because uh, it's more probable on theism than not theism. And that's all you need. Uh, and and I, I would leave it there. <laughs> Final thought from you, Stephen? Yes. Do I have a minute? Is that okay? You can have a minute. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. So even if the conclusion was true, which I hope I've shown a case to at least doubt it, that being that therefore the universe had a cause, it is very important to stress that all it would prove is that the universe had a cause and that's it. It wouldn't prove that the universe was caused by a single thing. It wouldn't prove that the cause or causes were themselves uncaused. It wouldn't prove that the cause must be a being or beings. And given this, it certainly wouldn't prove that the being or beings were omnipotent, omnipresent or omnibenevolent, or that they cared about human affairs, or that they authored or co-authored a book that's saturated with scientific errors, or even that they are good beings as opposed to indifferent or evil. This is all to say an echo of my hero Christopher Hitchens that um, the best way to put it is that even if it was true you still have all of your all, you still have everything ahead of you all to the get work to. is still ahead of you okay. yeah and the last thing I would say just in reference to the Big Bang being evidence for Christianity even if it was the case it's evidence for Christianity in the same way that a headache is evidence for cancer it could also be evidence for sleep deprivation. It could be evidence for many, many other things, you know, the common cold, smallpox. So evidence for everything is evidence for nothing. We're going to leave it there. I appreciate we could have many more responses back and forth, but our time is limited on Unbelievable, sadly. Uh, we may have to take this into YouTube instead <laughs> in the future. For the moment, thank you so much, Stephen and Blake, for being with me. Uh, thank you very thank much you. for your time. Thank you, Blake, and thank you to all yeah. the listeners. Thank you for taking your time.